This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. Today. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. You started. Yeah, okay, we're recording now. And so the reason I'm wearing the hat is I started wearing that today. And you can't, once you start wearing the hat, you can't stop because your hair does weird things. Yep. So it says, it says Lindale, which is appropriate for today's episode. So. Welcome to the Wedge Live Podcast. I'm John Edwards, your host. I have two guests, or maybe one co-host and one guest. We don't know. Uh, Ash Narayanan? Narayanan. Narayanan. Okay. I had the wrong emphasis. Correct. But you got it right the second time. You are from R Streets, the executive director. Is that your official title? Correct. I'm the executive director of R Streets Minneapolis. Okay, which is a Safe Streets advocacy organization. Uh, Safe Streets is part of what we do in general. Our mission is to try and make the city of Minneapolis better for everybody who bikes, walks, and rolls. Uh, And rolling meaning people in wheelchairs or people using micro-mobility like electric scooters. And my co-host or our second guest, we don't know, Alyssa Shuffman. Who, Correct. You are a board me- you're a board member of our streets, right? Uh yes, I am a board member at our streets. I'm the treasurer, so I get to do the boring financial stuff that is super important behind the scenes. Um and then my day job, I work at Move Minnesota. I'm the director of strategic partnerships, so working towards uh better transit uh and also better transportation, sustainable transportation across the state of Minnesota. And you're you're on an advisory committee. I don't know if we can name it. But you what? you do a lot of stuff related to uh, making streets safer for everyone, right? I do. I chair the Minneapolis Bicycle Advisory Committee uh, as of March, I think, of this year. So I don't know why we wouldn't okay. be able to name it. <laughs> I, I you were very nervous about what you could or could not say about your your uh, your various roles. I know you had to talk to a comms person. But I I'm did. Glad I we ironed that out. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Okay. I'm promoting you to co-host. I've decided after hearing in your bio, I'm promoting you to co-host. So, <laughs> All congratulations, right. Ash. You're Look out, Ash. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm used to being outnumbered. So, my idea for this episode was to talk about Lindale Avenue and use that as a jumping-off point to talk about streets in general, county streets versus city streets. Why do we care about this? Things like that. Yeah. Okay. And Ash, you're. Are you, am I right that you're like educated as like a traffic engineer or do I have that wrong? So I went, uh, my undergrad was in civil engineering and then I came to the United States to go to grad school in traffic engineering. So my degrees are in civil and traffic engineering, but I'm not a professional engineer in that I haven't taken the exam to get licensed. Okay. So you, you know enough to know when a traffic engineer is bullshitting you. Like you're not your, not your normal activist, right? That, uh, I, yeah, I mean, maybe that's a good way of putting it. I feel like uh, I got to see how the sausage was made, so to speak, uh, while in grad school and uh, really kind of understood how much of traffic engineering um, perpetuates the status quo of unsafe streets, streets that lead to worse climate change and streets that just don't work for anyone, which is kind of how I got into activism. So a street like Lindale, Alyssa, maybe you can talk about this. There's a relationship between the speed of the traffic, how many lanes there are, uh, just really fast, really wide roads are dangerous to people outside of vehicles, right? And inside of vehicles, yes, which means to everybody. And inside of vehicles. Yeah, I think, I mean, kind of taking a step back from Lindale specifically, right? Our transportation system has been so designed around uh, the movement and storage of cars is a phrase I feel like I've heard Ash say over and over again and other folks say over and over again. Um, 
And there's this way in which we treat traffic as inevitable. Like um, we sort of imagine that like, if there's a certain amount of cars on the street, that is how many cars will always be there and we must accommodate them. Um, but I think when you take a step back from that, it's like obviously flawed logic, right? I mean, cars do not drive places that we don't have streets. Uh, and if we have less lane miles, we will have less people driving on them because they will do other things. They will walk, they will bike, they will take transit. Yeah, and one of the metrics they use for doing things like a 4-3 conversion is, is it 20,000 vehicles? It is. Is that what so, the standard is? Yeah, there's some federal. So this this is like the best and worst part of being in transportation is like, it's sort of like this giant jigsaw puzzle where you are trying to figure out like who published what manual in what year that says this thing about why a street has to be this way if you get money from this agency, right? It's like this whole mess of things where like Lindale gets federal dollars. So there are county state aid highway things attached. And there's also like the federal highway administration manuals. And then like Hennepin County has its own things and city of Minneapolis has its own things. Um, but there is like a federal highway administration general guide and Ash can like check me on the numbers as the traffic engineer person. I was an English writing major. We have very different backgrounds. Um, uh, where you're supposed to have like a traffic volume between like 4,000 and 20,000 cars on a street uh, for it to be suitable for air quotes suitable for a 43 conversion. And uh, Lindale, um, when they last did a traffic count in 2019, had close to 30,000 cars on the, on, uh, the stretch, like closest to um, the freeway exit. It go, it, it's between like 20, 25 and 30 for that stretch between the freeway exit and Lake Street. And what uh, what that maybe doesn't consider is maybe we don't want that many cars moving super fast through a highly populated area like the Wedge with, you know, tens of thousands of people living on either side in those neighborhoods, Whittier and the Wedge, on that nine block stretch of Lindell Avenue. You know, if the street is moving that many cars that fast every day, maybe that's a bad thing and we w shouldn't try to perpetuate that. Yeah, there is just nothing in any of the manuals that says, like, we should reduce all of the cars. We should reduce all of the driving. We should get rid of cars. Cars are bad. <laughs> or some of the cars, at least, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this kind of reminds me of my first days in grad school and my first class in traffic engineering, where the professor was really proud of the fact that Americans had driven more and more each year, starting in 1960-something. Uh, and, you know, consistently we drove more every single year. And then we came to 2007, where there was a slight drop in how much people drove. And he was kind of distraught by it. And he was trying to figure out why that was the case and how we could get back to, you know, our growth mentality of putting on at least 2% more miles each year uh, than the previous year. Uh, that was kind of my one of my first... Um, moments where I was thinking that this doesn't sound right. Like, are we just going to keep driving until infinity and then all of our city is just paved over with asphalt? Um, and so, yeah, I think, John, you're absolutely right that, you know, moving so many cars through a dense urban neighborhood is not what our values are, what what are, uh, and, it, it, and it doesn't reflect our priorities as a community or as a neighborhood. Um, but maybe we can just take a step back and see what we mean by a four to three conversion, right? And what yeah. Lindale is today and what we'd like to have happen on it. Right. Yeah. Um, so today, Lindale Avenue is one of several streets in Minneapolis that are owned and operated by Hennepin County, not by the city of Minneapolis, but by Hennepin County, which the city of Minneapolis lies in. Uh, so it is a, what is called a four lane undivided street, which means that there are two car lanes in each direction. And there's no divider in between them. There's no median. Uh, and these streets, uh, called four-lane undivided streets, are well known to have higher rates of crashes than other types of streets. And so one of, and, and Lindale is one of the worst streets in the city for uh, traffic crashes. Three out of the 10 worst intersections for crashes are on Lindale Avenue. Um, and so the reason why there are so many crashes is because, one, the lanes are too wide. Two, uh, there's too many lanes. 
and three, um, there's a lot of traffic on them. And so there's a lot of weaving and there's a lot of merging. There's people trying to get ahead of each other in cars. There are no crosswalks on many parts of Lindale. Um, and even the places where there are crosswalks, it doesn't really feel safe or comfortable to use. Uh, and so one of the ways we can actually get to a safer street is through this uh, safety treatment called a four to three conversion, um, where we remove one lane in each direction and put uh, uh, what we call a twiddle, a two-way center turn lane in the middle. That's what those <laughs> that's are traffic called? engineer. Did yeah, you just make uh, that up? You made that up. That's not really what it's called. It's not called I, a twiddle. I mean, uh, I, I, I didn't make it up. I thought that people were joking when they first said it, uh, but these, this is traffic engineer lingo. Uh, so twiddles and we and, uh, and four lane undivided. It's all of this is traffic engineering lingo that... I don't know. It doesn't. I don't like it. But, did, um, did you break your microphone? <laughs> well, I I get very animated when I talk about me talking uh, about twiddles or three conversions. Yeah. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah, you sound great. Okay. Except for the the big explosion when your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, Hennepin County has done these four to three conversions on streets all across. Minneapolis, all across the Twin Cities, uh, and in in the cities that Hennepin County, uh, cities that lie within Hennepin County, uh, yet they refuse to do so on Lindale Avenue, and uh, this clearly means that they are prioritizing those thirty thousand vehicles that need to get in and out of the city more than the lives of the people who you know walk and bike and roll, but also drive along the corridor. And this is something that we at Our Streets Minneapolis think is unacceptable and is also symptomatic of um, the larger issue of us prioritizing car throughput over human life. One of the things I've been, I don't know if reassured is the right word, but like it feels good to show up to some of these gripe sessions with Marion Green and hear people like sharing experiences like mine, uh, sharing my perspective on what we need to do to fix it which is not always what you hear at public meetings when it comes to streets and parking, traffic, housing development. You'll hear a lot of opposition to change. I sense a lot of support for these kinds of changes. People are frustrated with Hennep- with uh, Lindell Avenue and Hennepin Avenue. Uh, so the, the politics feels like it's going in our direction, but it's hard to know how to to translate the politics into action by Hennepin County because you don't know who to blame. Is it the elected official? Is it Marion Green, the county commissioner? Is it public works? And I know I've talked about you, talked about this with you, Ash. Like, who who do we have to hassle to get this to change? It's, it's hard to know this stuff. You follow it very closely. I'm not sure if you even know what buttons to push and levers to pull to make the change. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, We are facing an entrenched system of transportation planning and engineering that's been perpetuating the status quo for for decades. Uh, And so there's many, many different parts of the equation here. Uh, But in general, there's, you know, staff at Hennepin County Public Works who you know, decide, design the projects, uh, uh, decide what kinds of configuration streets should be. Uh, there's elected officials who have the final decision-making power on what gets funded at Hennepin County. And then there's, uh, you know, constituents who also put pressure on uh, elected officials and public works staff to do what they think is right. I think, um, I, 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 you're right, and I don't know who exactly the person is who makes the decision behind closed doors at Hennepin County, but I do think we're making progress. Uh, for example, in the community forum that we held uh, about Lindale a, a couple of weeks ago, for the first time, we heard uh, an elected official, Commissioner Marion Green, commit to a pilot project for a four to three conversion. If not on the time frame that we would like to have happen, that was the first time I heard an elected official say the words, four to three conversion on Lindale Avenue. Uh, We are hearing that from within public works, people are listening um, and we are, uh, we're seeing change happen. For example, Hennepin County in their latest climate action plan 
Uh, this is the plan that's going to try and reduce carbon emissions from Hennepin County over the next 20 years or so. Uh, put in a, a driving reduction goal in that climate action plan. And I think both of those things are a result of advocacy done by folks who live uh, alongside you know, Lindale and all the other county streets that we've been uh, building coalitions around. Uh, and, you know, a growing recognition that uh, this is important to just a diverse group of people. Like you said, John, it's very rare to see so many people agree on the same thing at a public work, at a public meeting. And usually it's, you know, not the things that we would like to right. see happen. Yeah. And so you mentioned a uh, climate plan for the county. Alyssa, you might have thoughts about cities and counties and local governments sticking to their adopted plans and policies and following through on that. How likely are we to see a local government stick to uh, like complete streets, the transportation action plan, all very good. And the, the tap was adopted recently. That, that was good, right? Yeah. Um, so I've been reflecting on this a lot lately. Um, and I think the thing Ash said earlier about uh, we're facing X number of years of entrenched planning culture is very real, right? We have a lot of policies and our, our processes for getting to outcomes are like not in line with the policies yet, right? The policies are just a piece of paper. They don't reflect a culture change within um, different jurisdictions and levels of government, um, which is not terribly surprising because we also have, uh, we see those like same cultural challenges in society writ large, right? Like it, it is hard for people to change. People like things in theory and struggle with things in practice, right? Like that's why we have this whole term of like, right, the not in my backyard, the NIMBYs, like you can do something good, but don't do it here. I don't want you to change the way that I interact with my day-to-day -day environment. Um, so I think that's another piece of it that we have to figure out how to tackle um, alongside those policies. And I think, um, also related to your earlier question about um, who is who is the actor, right? Like who is the person with the ability to make change here? I think we also have to be thinking about as we're trying to take some of these policy documents and hold people accountable to them, um, identifying those different actors, the good actors and the bad actors, um, not to oversimplify. I, I think that's, that's probably an oversimplification, but right, like even when we talk about Minneapolis public works, right? Like we talk about the city of Minneapolis as a whole, right? And the city having a perspective, but often we mean Minneapolis public works. And then we even within Minneapolis public works, there are four different transportation divisions and they all have like very different sets of responsibilities and sort of outlooks on what the work they're doing is, right? Like the traffic and parking services division of public works is going to push for traffic and parking because that's like a major part of their job. Um, and so I think part of the challenge we have is translating some of those policy documents into culture change and then also making sure that we're trying to like hold the right people accountable and pull those right levers. And it's, it's very, very complicated, right? Like even on the Hennepin County meeting with Marion Green that Ash referenced, I think there was some conversation about, and I'm curious about your take on this, Ash, about how like someone within city of Minneapolis is sort of pushing back on this idea of the four to three conversion and they're not totally on board and they're concerned about like traffic flowing into side streets. Um, and that's like something that I've heard in a couple different spaces recently, but like hadn't previously heard as something coming out of city of Minneapolis public works. So um, that's a very long way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> right. I think we have a lot of really great policies. I think we have a lot of really great folks who, um, want us to follow the policies and I'm not sure that we have the right folks in the right positions to make those things happen right now. And that's also part of the work is to say, um, you know, who is the next Minneapolis public works director going to be? Let's push for that person to be super, super visionary. Uh, let's make sure that that person is thinking about the people on our streets and the experience of like, I live right by Lake street. Right. So I think of, I live in Phillips Powderhorn is South of Lake street. I don't ever go to Powderhorn. It's like a whole other city as far as I'm concerned because walking across Lake Street is just too much work. I have to wait at the corner like 5 minutes. I could be some I could be at a different park by then. So um, Right. Yeah. So, but 
I, I kind of peppered a couple things in there, Ash, that uh, if you wanted to respond to them, you're more than welcome. <laughs> Alyssa has that authority. She is co-host, so. She's co-host, yes. And uh, she's also treasurer of my board, so she gets to ask me very tough questions every other Thursday about why there's a certain line item in my budget that I don't know. I don't know the answer to. No. You uh, always have the answers. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, I just want to uh, point out, you know, we do have a moment in our city right now where we can choose a new public works director uh, because Robin Hutchison, our former public works director, was recruited by Joe Biden to go and work in his administration. Uh, so Our Streets Minneapolis and Alyssa's organization, Move Minnesota and other organizations um, uh, led a campaign to get the mayor to commit to hiring uh, are doing a national search to hire a new public works director, which the mayor did. Uh, the uh, search is in progress right now, um, and we hope that the new public works director will be someone who is visionary and compassionate and is committed to the cause of racial justice and cares about climate change and really understands that uh, our streets and our cities are places for people and not just cars. You know, one of the things that is, so I come from a place that doesn't have local politics. And so moving to Minneapolis in 20, 2012 and getting involved in caring about these issues, I remember, you know, not knowing anything. And I, you know, I was surprised to learn that these streets are not reconstructed every decade or every two decades these these streets were last reconstructed, I think Hennepin Avenue in the 50s. Maybe Lindale Avenue is the same. So these are literally once in a lifetime opportunities. And if we don't take advantage of them, we're stuck with a bad street for a really long time, potentially. Um, yes, it is true that we don't reconstruct our streets for, for a generation. Uh, at the same time, I I, I don't think we have to wait uh, for 30 or 40 years for, to take immediate action on um, on the worst streets that Minneapolis has. So uh, I always think of it like this. There are, there are good streets and then there are bad streets. There are streets on which traffic crashes always seem to be happening. And then there are streets on which traffic crashes don't happen all that much. Lindale is an example of the former. Um, I think that we have many things that we can do today uh, on streets like Lindale Avenue South uh, Franklin Avenue, Lowry Avenue Northeast, West Broadway Avenue, Hennepin Avenue. Um, we don't need to wait for full reconstructions to happen to make them better and more comfortable for people not in cars or even people in cars. We can use paint to reduce the number of lanes that these streets have. We can re reduce the, the, the width of these lanes. That is a proven effect on reducing uh, car speeds. We can paint marked crosswalks. We can widen sidewalks. All of these can be done with, at a very low cost, can be done immediately, and can be done with funds that we already have that we are using for, for maintenance, essentially. Um, and then the other thing I just want to point out is that entities like the Minnesota Department of Transportation today are spending hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, on building new auto-centric infrastructure. Uh, in the next four years, we're going to be spending $896 million on capacity expansion projects throughout this metro area. Uh, and so this is just a reflection of our priorities. It would cost about between $300 and $600 million to make sure that every single street in, in, Mini in Minnesota has uh, good pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and we have the money to do it today. We're just choosing not to do it because we uh, we value the primacy of the automobile over uh, the, of the lives of people wa biking, walking, and rolling. You mentioned was it nine hundred million dollars? Was that the uh, the min yeah, number? You close gave? to nine hundred million over oh, four that, years. That reminds me of a rumor I heard on Nextdoor that Minneapolis spent that much on a bike lane. Nine hundred million dollars turned out not to be true. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, uh, did you, paint's who, not that expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that uh, investigative journalism. That is why we need high quality local yeah. news. <laughs> thank you. Alyssa, do you have questions? You are the co-host. I wonder if things are rattling around in your brain right now. 
Um, I, my style is more to say things and have a conversation and resp- and give Ash a chance to respond. Or you, you yeah, can also ahead. respond. That's, that's that's appropriate. I am also thinking about right. So some of what you said, Ash, is about like we don't have to do a total reconstruction every time we do a street. I also think we're like not very cre- like. Public works processes are not intended to be creative processes, right? Like they're very, like you have a, a set of boxes, um, a set of rest- like constraints and you work within them. Um, but we can also be looking at things like, uh, you know, dedicated bus lanes as a way of doing, um, of reducing car lanes and making, str- like having traffic calming, right? When we put dedicated bu- bus lanes, there's a number of studies uh, I'm not like a data person, so I can't cite the study or the numbers like Ash does. Um, um, but that's like a way that we can do traffic calming that's sort of outside the standard like toolkit of, of traffic calming things. Um, you know, if we wanted, we could just like pull together some giant concrete planters uh, or, you know, uglier concrete barriers and just like close streets to cars and open them up to people walking and biking tomorrow. That's like a thing we could do, but it's not sort of within the normal bounds of what um, public works considers as part of its toolkit. And so it's really hard to get those options pushed forward. I'm also really interested in this question of like the human infrastructure on our streets, right? So um, when that comes up in positive and negative ways, right? When you think about like traffic enforcement is an example of human infrastructure on our streets, street harassment is an example of human infrastructure on our streets. Um, but that the flip side of that is like, you run into a friend while biking and then you get to bike together, right? Like that's an, that's an, a human infrastructure experience. Um, when I used to take the 21 bus or the 53, I think it's the 53. That's the express bus down Lake, right? There were like those commuters that you could see where they like all took the same bus at the same time every morning. And they were like having community on the bus, which was just like such a joy to witness, uh, as an irregular bus rider. Um, so I think there's also no, really no conversation about, like the human infrastructure of our streets that really happens. That's like also a really big part of this equation. And I think as we imagine what it's like to revisit our re reimagine our streets, um, that that's like a big piece of how we get from streets are awful, right? Like part of the assumption, um, with people who drive often is like, why would you want to walk? Why would you want to bike? Why would you want to take the bus? That's a, that's a terrible experience. And I can't say that they're like wrong all the time. I absolutely love biking and walking and being on the bus. And also I get harassed. Um, And so I really think that like nuanced discussion about we both need like the infrastructure infrastructure. And that's the stuff that we need from the public works department because that's like their deal and what they do. And also this like human infrastructure piece is really important. Yeah, uh, that's such a... um great way of thinking about it. I I think about it all the time where our streets are often the place where so many of our societal issues manifest, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, the patriarchy or uh, toxic masculinity uh, manifesting as street harassment or police brutality. Um, And when we talk about um, safety on our streets, we often just think about traffic crashes, but it's so much more than that. It should mean streets where you feel like it's nice to wait for the bus. It means streets that a school kid is able to get from her home to uh, school without being harassed. Uh, And uh, uh, a black person not being pulled over by uh, a cop while biking or driving. Um, And so um, uh, I think, you know, our advocacy really needs to be done in an intersectional manner where we try to uh, really engage what people care about the most and and tie it back to how we can change our streets, but also change all of our decision-making systems so that we really prioritize justice. I think it's also interesting to think about, right, like um, cars and buses and bikes is like this this space between human infrastructure and like infrastructure, infrastructure. I don't know what to call it if someone has a better term than that. Um, But right. Like one of the things that I'm really excited about in my workspace is this campaign we're doing called boost the bus, where we're looking at 
um, specific improvements to the high frequency network, um, uh, uh, Metro Transit's high frequency network. So there's like a number of lines that are supposed to come every 15 or so minutes. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes they come more frequently. Um, but there's all these like minute changes you can make to make that system work a lot better, right? And those aren't actually changing the streetscape, which is what we tend to think of as infrastructure, right? Like giving buses signal priority so that like the light turns green, like, yes, that's infrastructure, but also that's about the experience of the bus being on the street. Similarly, you know, we, when we're talking about cars, right, we tend to think of them as static infrastructure, but we're also like actually talking about drivers most of the time and like people's choices. Uh, like we are very much cultural and societal creatures. Um, and that is a huge part of why most people drive, even though they don't necessarily know they're subject to those like societal cultural pressures around driving, right? Like I didn't think of driving as a choice for a large part of my life uh, until I got hit by a car. And then I was like, oh, this is terrible. What is, what is this system? And started sort of digging into it and realized that like, there's a lot more here. And actually there's like a whole system of things invested in making sure I don't think about the fact that like cars are both infrastructure and also human infrastructure. So. What do we say when people tell us the electric cars are, are coming online? I hear that all the time. What do we tell those people? Because when I, when I think about, you talk about, you got to convince people by uh, using what's important to them. And I'm skeptical that people, people think of themselves as environmentalists, but I'm skeptical that they actually want to like change their lives to do anything about saving the planet or making the planet livable for future generations. So I think about like the day-to-day -day livability things. Like I like to be outside. I like to spend time outside, uh, be safe walking down Hennepin Avenue, be safe walking down Lindell Avenue, crossing the street to walk to the grocery store. I moved to the neighborhood I did because I picked out on a map where are the grocery stores and where are the bus lines? Where can I you know, get around the city by riding a bike? And I've been heartened. I think a lot of people live in Minneapolis for those reasons there's a lot of people who live here who maybe moved here decades ago and like moved here because it was easy to drive and feel like they're losing that but i feel that shift in mentality coming and so i started this with an idea for a question i'm ending it without an idea for a question so you it's your responsibility <laughs> to turn this prompt into something <laughs> ash you want this one or you want me to take it <laughs> Uh, I can start. Uh, I mean, what John said reminded me of the line in the office where guys like sometimes I start a sentence and I don't know where it's going. <laughs> until it but, I, have, um, I have not seen the office nor Parks and Rec. Uh, and that's the thing people give me a lot of grief about being in the space that I'm in. So, Well, you have time. Uh, and I believe the office is on Netflix, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, um, when people say that electric cars are coming online, yeah, there I we think go. it was electric uh, cars. That's where I started this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I think it's true. I think electric cars are probably coming online. Uh, many car companies are, like we saw the other day, Ford just launched a ridiculously large truck that is now electric, claiming that it is green and it's going to save the planet. <laughs> It's going to save the world, Ash. You need to pack up our streets and get out of get out of whatever business you're in. We don't need yeah. you anymore. Um, but I just want to point out, you know, the scale of where we are today. Um, you know, a, a vast majority of every single trip we make, uh, for whatever reason, going to work, going to the grocery store, taking your kids to soccer practice, most of it is made by cars, and um, we, you know, uh, we're not necessarily advocating for a world completely without cars. We're saying that we need to restore balance to how we get around in, in society. Uh, we think that many trips, uh, especially short trips, can be made by biking, walking and rolling or on transit. Uh, we think that our streets can be reshaped so that, uh, you know, today 80% of our city streets are uh, by one estimate, given over to cars, we think bringing some balance to that where we uh, allocate street space for biking, walking and rolling and transit uh, is is done. All of that will result in, you know, a pretty significant difference, but it, cars are still going to be part of the of, of cities, uh, likely, and electric cars are going to be a part of that solution. 
Um, having said that, you know, electric cars are are still cars. They still take up space in our cities. They are going to cause crashes. They have huge implications for you know battery uh, and the uh, and and materials needed for uh, its operation and and extraction, especially in um, in in countries that are in, uh, in Africa and Asia. Uh, and uh, they are um, uh, they're expensive, and so we think that while electric uh, uh, an electric car is probably better than a gas car, but it is not going to be uh, the solution to creating a zero carbon equitable transportation system that really works for everybody. Yeah, I I'm think also thinking about tire particles and brake dust. You forgot to mention those things. There's still pollution that comes out of there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you got. You got the whole checklist. I think, I think there's also, Ash, you sort of alluded to it, but I would say more explicitly, like the climate crisis, right? Um, people already have cars and people are going to hold on to those cars until they don't work anymore. That is largely the way that people like deal with their cars and deal with bikes as well, right? Like you hold on to your bike until it doesn't work for you anymore and then you sell it or get rid of it. And we're not going to have everybody in the world buy an electric car in the next 10 years. We can't even like make them fast enough to do that. So even all the other issues aside, right. When we think about the timeline we are working under to make like massive changes around um, the way we get around for climate, we can't, like, we just can't get there. Right. Like car electric vehicles are a piece of the puzzle and they are such a small piece of the puzzle and they get so much of the attention. Um, that we really need to like be moving beyond those pretty quickly. Yeah. And I also want to mention uh, in, in the piece of puzzle, electric uh, bikes are a big part of the solution, I think, as are electric scooters. Uh, and so electrification of transportation does not mean just cars. It also means electric micromobility options. Our transit needs to be electrified. Um, yeah. And just give me a place where I can like walk to the grocery store safely. Let me have Minneapolis, please. There's so many places where you can drive. Drive all you want. Did you know? Let let us have Minneapolis. (laughs) Did you know that Minnesota has the fifth highest number of road miles of any state in the United States? Like, Um, Like. like physical road miles, not road miles traveled, but like, like physical road miles. Like physical infrastructure road miles. And we're like number 22 and 26 geographically population wise. We just have so many roads for a state of our size and for the amount of people that live here. It is what's, ridiculous. What's, what's the land area? So are we like out punching our weight in terms of land area too? I don't understand your question. Sorry. Can you rephrase? <laughs> So you would assume if it's all in proportion that the largest states in land mass would have the most road miles, potentially? Yes. So that's what I meant by geographic area. Yeah. So we're like both for population Uh size and also like land mass. We're sort of we're in the 20s somewhere and we have the fifth highest number of road miles. So. Hmm. Okay. And we are continuing to expand the number of lane miles we have in the state, uh, an o- hugely overbuilt part of our infrastructure. And we continue to expand it, like I said, at a cost of billions of dollars. And we don't have uh, the money to maintain what are uh, the existing roads that we have. And we don't have the money to pay for pedestrian, bike, and transit improvements as a result. So back to Lindale Avenue, one of the things Marion Green, I think it was an announcement she said that uh, Lindell was on the capital improvement plan. Is that what it's called? The CIP? I think that's what it's called. Yes. And it, that's like a five year infrastructure plan. Does that mean Lindale Avenue is going to be reconstructed in five years? Is that what I'm supposed to interpret that as? Um, I think we can interpret it as saying it will be at least five years before Lindale Avenue is reconstructed. Uh, so it could be anywhere within the next five years that uh, that the that the street is re- is reconstructed. So um, uh, we don't know exactly when it will be, but it needs to first get on the plan, and it'll take at least five years for that plan to go into effect. That's the Hennepin County CIP. Correct. Correct. Okay. If it was the Minneapolis CIP, I could have more insights on that because I served on the Capital Long Range Improvements Committee, uh, but I did not 
I don't know how Hennepin County does things. It's a black box. What, what would it mean in Minneapolis? So in Minneapolis, we do this annual budget cycle, right? Um, where every year we, in the fall, the departments sort of figure out what do they want to propose? Um, what are their priorities? And they put forth a slate of options. Those get put in front of a committee called the Capital Long Range Improvements Committee. Um, and this is just the infrastructure components, right? So Capital Long Range Improvements Committee. Um, so those departments put forth their capital requests. Those go in front of the um, Capital Long Range Improvements Committee. They do a bunch of rankings and spreadsheet math about when we can pay for things over the course of the next five years. That goes to the mayor's office as part of the budget package, and then that goes to city council and is approved as part of the budget. But what happens every year is you pass a five to six year budget. It used to be five years, and they just extended it to six years, um, which means every year, everything beyond the current year is up for reconsideration. And if it was in the budget before, you have a higher chance of it being in the budget again, um, but that is not a guarantee, right? It's sort of a like best guess as to what might happen in those what uh, what they call the out years, um, but it's not it's not a firm commitment because every year they revisit the next five to six year period. Okay, thank you. You know, capital long range improvement committee stuff is great for podcasts. I think people love that stuff. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly <laughs> the kind of thrilling content people tune in for. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ash, you look like you're furiously Googling something. Is that what you were doing? I was trying to see, I was trying to find the email from Commissioner Green about when exactly Lindale would be put into the uh, the, long, the improvement plan. I couldn't find it. Okay. So what should we be telling the average person to do to uh, yeah. make a difference here? Contact their commissioners, their city council members. A yeah, apply for, to be on the Capital Long Range Improvement Committee. What should what should we be doing? Yeah, uh, so I think all of those things. Um, we uh, the the ask that we have at uh, which you know is a, is a, is the bare minimum that we're asking for um, is a four to three conversion on Lindale Avenue this summer, and um, a four to three conversion will not. Uh, is not a long-term solution. A four to three conversion is just going to, uh, quote unquote, stop the bleeding. It will make the street a little bit safer for everybody in the near term. It can be done really quickly. It can be done without uh, um, without a huge capital expenditure. Uh, and we think it should be done this summer. We think that it can be done and should be done in, in the next few weeks, honestly. Uh, so I think folks should be calling Marion uh, Green, Commissioner Marion Green. They should be com calling their other county commissioners if they live in other parts of Minneapolis to say that we need to fix uh, the, the street that has the three most dangerous intersections on it. Um, we should also be contacting Hennepin County uh, Public Works staff. Uh, we should contact uh, Lisa Cerny, who is the Public Works Director. Uh, and we should also be letting our city council members know. Uh, so... Uh, Council President Lisa Bender, uh, who over oversees part of um, Lindale Avenue, is someone we should be talking to. Uh, and then I think uh, uh, also recognizing this is just not a problem with Lindale Avenue South. It's it's many different county roads across the city. And so, uh, but there's action that we can take right away that will have immediate uh, short-term benefits, and we should be doing it. There's no reason for us not to be doing it. Yeah, and one of the things with a street reconstruction, when you're thinking about all these newly adopted city policies on transportation, like if you don't get it right, uh, obviously we're talking about a county street, but if you if you start setting the pattern that you're ignoring the policies and not getting it right, it becomes easier to continue ignoring the policies. So it's important yeah. to start getting it right so we can keep getting it right into the future. Absolutely. Every single street project should not become a fight. Um, uh, we we should just start getting street projects that have protected bike lanes on them, that have protected, uh, that have transit lanes on them, that have, uh, you know, wide sidewalks, that uh, have crosswalks everywhere. There's good lighting, there's street trees, there's benches. All of those are things that we deserve in our city uh, and not something that we need to fight for or beg for 
uh, in every single project. Frankly, it you know it just shows that we are continuing to value uh, car centricity uh, and the movement of cars over you know the comfort and uh, safety of people who live in the city. And I'll put on a plug for contacting Kevin Reich, who is the uh, chair of the Transportation and Public Works Committee on the City Council. Contact right. that guy too. Yep. And uh, you know, keep an eye out for Hennepin Avenue because that's uh, that might come up for a vote this year as far as the design for Hennepin Avenue. Yeah, Hennepin Avenue, in my mind, is one of the most consequential city reconstruction projects uh, for our generation. Uh, this is the first major project that is uh, coming up for reconstruction after the city passed uh, Minneapolis 2040 and the Associated Transportation Action Plan. Uh, there's a there's the Vision Zero uh, action plan, and we frankly think that this is the city's biggest opportunity to showcase and show us what its goals are, what its equity and climate goals are. Uh, uh, we are still, you know, the, the the designs that the city has brought forward. Uh, one of them does not have protected bike infrastructure on it, um, and the other uh, has a bus lanes but no bike bike lanes. We think that we. Uh, should put our money where our mouth is, do what our plans say, and really make sure that Hennepin County reflects uh, what we as a city have collectively voted on to say that we we care about. Alyssa, what should we be doing? Are there any uh, actions you think we should be taking? I mean, I think uh, weighing in on Hennepin Avenue, there's a petition going around. Um, you can find it on the movemn.org website if you would like to sign it. I think everything Ash said it's true, right? It will set a precedent for how we um, handle our streets in the city moving forward. Um, you know, one thing that is always, uh, I think, really important as we're contacting all of our people, right, is to not just focus on what's bad, but like, we're not, and and not just focus on like the street infrastructure that we want, which I think is all really, like, it's all really important as well. But like, this isn't about that. This is about like kids being able to walk to school safely and you being able to get to your job or, uh, or like the twin stadium or the theater or, you know, walk to your local restaurant or, <laughs> uh, walk to Aldi, Aldi. It's all about Aldi. I need to get to Aldi. It's across Lindell Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> is it really? <laughs> yeah. I have to cross Lindell Avenue to get to Aldi. It's a block oh, away, yeah. but I mean, you're, and if you've forgotten your quarter, you have to cross back, go home and come back again. Yeah, I don't, I don't cross back. I just like I grab a stray box and I fill that box with stuff. And then that's how I do it. If you forget a bag or don't have a quarter for a card at Aldi, just find a box, like toss all the chips out of the box, have that empty box and fill it with stuff. That's ah, what you do. This should be called the Life Pro Tips podcast yeah. with Reg Life. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry for interrupting you with my Aldi. No, rant, I mean, Alyssa. It, it is exactly the thing, though, right? Like, we're not doing this work just for the sake of doing the work. We're doing it because it really impacts people's lives. Um, this is a this is a human story, right? Um, and I, and that is the kind of thing that moves people in the long term, right? It is pretty exhausting. We all know from being in this space to hear stories over and over again of what is wrong with our streets and the trauma that people have experienced on our streets in a lot of ways. Um, and there's also a lot of hope, right? Minneapolis has so many great policies right now that it didn't have decades ago. Um, we are like turning the culture and turning the ship and it feels too slow. Um, and also it's, it's like a huge leap forward and it's really exciting because of all those things that impact our day-to-day -day lives. So I think um, it's important for us to continue to tell that story of like why the work matters as much as what the work is, which is... I mean, I tend to like dive right into what the work is. We've done that over and over again during this conversation. So, yeah, I think that's my value. You both know stuff. I'll, I, I don't know anything. I just have my lived experience. I just tell stories. That's the kind of work that we need to have happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, I think it's, it's folks lived experience. Like you said, Alyssa, that is going to move people in power. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. What you said is right. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't have protected bike lanes in the city. And today we consistently rank in lists of, of good biking places to be. We know that there's a long way to go, but, um, you know, we, we have made positive change. Uh, the 
the city has a specific goal of having three out of every five trips be made by a mode other than a car by 2030. And that did not come out of isolation. All of that came from, you know, the work uh, that people have done, the stories that people have told. Uh, and I think, you know, today, uh, the New York Times, for example, is talking about cities that want to take out highways from the uh, from their city centers. All of that is is a result of, you know, tireless organizing done by countless folks across the country. And so, Alyssa, thank you for that reminder of, of how far we've come and how important it is to also let our elected officials know that, you know, when they do something that we agree with, that we appreciate. It. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's like part of what is so exciting about like the ways in which Move Minnesota and our streets are partnering, right? Is I think we are holding that vision together of like, we can have the sidewalks and the bike lanes and the transit, you know, it's not, we shouldn't have to choose between one or the other. Like our, vi- our vision is big enough for both and our dreams are big enough for, for everything. So. Melissa, do you want to have the uh, final word since you're the co-host? That wasn't it. Our big dreams. No, I mean, <laughs> this, this, it felt like it, but I wanted to give you one last chance before I uh, officially close out the show. Ash, do you have any final words? I'd love to hear what Alyssa has to say. Yeah, Alyssa, it's it's back on you. Oh no, ready? Uh, I've never been to an Aldi. <laughs> oh really? Is that like yes. a, a moral stance or nope, just? It, uh, oh no, actually, a that's a lie. I went to an Aldi in Germany, but I've never been to an Aldi stateside. <laughs> oh, why not? I just have never gotten there. They're not on my walking and biking routes. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's good so. deals, and that middle aisle with the weird and wacky products. And they don't have too many products, right? So it saves you mental energy of having to choose. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's all Aldi brand products made to look like fancy brand products. The The design on their their packaging is great. Yeah, yeah and aren't Aldi and Trader Joe's uh, related somehow? Uh, I, th- I think... There's two Aldis. There's like an Aldi South and an Aldi North or something. I don't know. There's some weird stuff going on in Germany before they came here. I, I don't know. I don't know the uh, the real story, but yeah, Google it. Well, Look up Aldi on Wikipedia. It's an interesting uh, history. You're the Aldi expert. I rely on you for that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I can't recount the history though. Okay. Well, it feels like we're done now that we're talking about Aldi. I thought that was a good closer. Aldi's come up a couple times. I think yeah. has Aldi come up in every podcast episode. If not, it should should be like your uh, Easter it's egg. It's come up in several. Yeah, I, I bring it up all the time. <laughs> I had a really good way of closing the show, but I got distracted with the Aldi stuff, so now I, I've forgotten what I was going to do. It was going to be great. But was I, it about I, big I dreams? No, I don't think so. I don't. I, it's completely slipped my mind. I guess I just have to close out the show. Mm-hmm. Thanks for having us. This was a fun conversation to get to nerd out about the things that I nerd out about all day, every day. Yeah, yeah, we spent a Friday talking about streets. It's still light outside. I can get you you out of here before it's dark. Okay. I will take you up on that offer. Thank you for the opportunity. It's great talking to both of you. Yeah, my guess has been... I'm going to get the emphasis on your last name wrong again. So my guess is Do you want me to just say it? Yeah, Ash from Our Streets, whose last name is? Ash Narayanan, and I'd like you to say it also. Narayanan. Yeah, great. I mean, it's easy to get. It's just, I, it's one of those names where you want to say it wrong. Yeah, you okay. should just have a little um, post-it note on your desk for easy reference for the future. <laughs> Narayanan. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and uh, my co-host has been Alyssa Shuffman. I'm no Peggy Thank Sue. You, She's got big shoes to fill. <laughs> hey, you, you were good. You're, uh, you're. Yeah, I know. I just love Peggy Sue. I think she's number one. There she is, Miss Northeast Minneapolis. <laughs> I was going to call you the poor man's Peggy Sue, but that felt insulting. But I said it anyway. I'll ask Peggy Sue what she thinks. <laughs> I'm cutting that. I'm cutting that out of the show. Okay. You don't edit We're... anything, but you'll edit that. <laughs> <laughs> I will edit out my bad jokes that make me look bad. <laughs> uh...
Okay. <laughs> this was a very efficient episode. We got to a lot in just 53 minutes. I feel bad that we're ending so soon. I usually go 90 minutes, but we are officially done and I'm pressing stop. This is a real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. Today. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now.